and welcome everybody to our next, our current meeting on Great Expectations. Um, and uh, I just want to thank Courtney for uh, mentioning the business meeting that will follow at the end of today's session. And um, uh, uh, I also want to thank Wayne, who's been the president of the Pickwick Club and who continues to be president and uh, who has helped us to organize these sessions on Great Expectations and has led them himself. And then finally to, to thank David Brownell, who will uh, be the leader of today's uh, discussion. And uh, I'll be here in the background, of course, as a participant. And, um, and I also wanna thank Courtney, uh, who is both the uh, uh, Dickens Project Assistant Director and the treasurer of the uh, Pickwick Club. And so who, who manages our money and uh, has reminded us about the donation that we will discuss at the end of today's meeting. So um, I, I expect that we will have some other people joining us as we move forward, but I want to thank everyone for being here and uh, turn things over to David Brownell. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, if I say anything that's outrageously untrue, I am relying on you to correct me because <laughs> I'm going in sub directions where my knowledge uh, is a little shaky. And you please do the same for me if I make errors of fact. Okay. Um, shall I start? Please. Okay. Would you like me to share a screen, David? Uh, one moment and then the first screen. Okay. General statement. My mind tends to work always at a tangent. So you will notice occasionally that I go have gone off in some weird direction. Gravity <laughs> usually brings me back, but uh, and I do <laughs> usually have a connection in mind, so don't worry too much. Okay, let's look at the first slide. My thanks to Ava, who has put these together and is running them. I thought we would do best to start off by uh, taking an inventory so that we all know where we are. So first question. I am not seeing people, so I can't see hands. Uh, Ava will help us if there is a raised hand. And so, the, David, your, your question is, what were Pip's expectations during the first stage? A comment while people are oh, thinking. Uh, Glenna, is, uh, Glenna and Martha both have their hands raised. Okay. Well, One. I'm not saying anything very profound, but um, Pip thinks that probably Miss Havisham is his sponsor, and he expects, maybe hopes, that she is designing him for Estella. And um, he thinks he's on his way to being a gentleman. Good. You hit the essential points there. Uh, anybody have anything more? Martha? Martha? Take this off. Well, I was going to say something more bizarre. Um, just if you go to the very beginning of the book, his first stage of expectation was not to get in trouble because of that that prisoner. Who, yeah, who was taking things from from the family, and um, so so it shows how you know scared he was, how young he was, um, how very simple, you know, a country boy. And um, 
And I think then that experience then makes the one that you just mentioned, Glenna, more poignant because he really wants to change his status. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, um, I'd like to add that I probably read this four or five times. This is the best read I've ever had. I really appreciate doing it in smaller sections. And I feel the emotion more because of that, I believe. And I, I also feel that we're seeing exactly what Dickens himself went through as he went from lower class to higher class. Yeah, good. Uh, Shana? Thanks for the interest. Uh, I ask. Oh, yeah, I, I was more. just going to throw in that I think that his relationship with Joe, um, how he was afraid to... to to kind of go back and see him kind of you know like now that he was going to be upper class he had this this feeling of you know well you know i don't know if i can still be friends with you know and uh, these other people now you know because now that i'm upper class maybe i shouldn't be seen with them i felt like I really really had a struggle with the class system that, that as he started to evolve right and I I don't know what chapter we're on today, but somebody could just quickly tell me that where we're starting today, what chapter. So I don't know. That was my comment that I don't think he, his relationships were changing. Well, one of the things that interests me about Dickens as we get into his later books is how much thought he gives to the subject of structure. This one, he structures in capital letters, the three stages. He wants you to know where you're at. Uh, okay. Uh, drop in the next question, please, Ava. What are Pip's expectations now? And David, could you explain a little bit about what you mean by now? Well, now being the second stage, since we were looking at the first stage and Dickens tells us when that ended. And now, in the first stage, Pip was really, at least to begin with, expecting that he was going to grow up and be a blacksmith. But then he got discontented. And now, all of a sudden, everything has changed. What does he think his future is? at the point that he leaves home and goes to London. Okay, uh, Barbara. Barbara. Well, one thing I really noticed reading it this time was the, how um, he begins to encounter how that this is actually gonna be some work. It's not going to just be, um, you know, we have that delightful scene where um, he's being taught how to use a spoon and a knife, and and then uh, the fact that um, the looking around kind of joke, and he's uh, learning about money, all kinds of things that he um, he's going to have to figure some things out. It's not just um, poof, he's going to be successful and be a gentleman. Yeah, good. Uh, Wayne has his hand up. Okay, Wayne. You're muted. You're still muted. There you okay. go. Okay, here we go. Uh, what I pick up in this phase of the novel 
it's a, a, a lot of ambivalence in Pip. It's very delicately stated, but he keeps thinking, well, life was pretty good here, but I still want something else. And uh, at one point he says that he had looked forward to working with Joe as a blacksmith. And yet that of course is not a career goal for him anymore. That's it. Yeah. Okay, Ava, drop in the next question. Irene has her hand up. Oh. Oh, oh never mind. Okay. Um, the next question is how do his changed expectations change Pip? Wayne, your hand's still up. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll take it down. Okay. Irene has her hand up. Irene, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, I was actually commenting on the previous one, but I'll move on to this one. Uh, I was a bit confused at the beginning because I think the first answer identified the first stage as the second stage, the one we're now talking about, uh, where Pip already knows that he has expectations and is going to, into a new life to become a gentleman. Uh, so stage one is the one that you were just talking about, where he was expecting to be the blacksmith, and stage two is where he is preparing to be the gentleman. So I think we need to clarify that, because I got a bit confused at the beginning about which stages we were talking about. Okay. And then as to, to his changing and expectations, changing him, I'm not so sure they're changing him, but what they are doing is making him less attractive in the ways that he was unattractive before. In other words, his own snobbishness was always the least attractive part of him from the early, even from the early part of the, the novel. And that's being enhanced now that he thinks he has a chance of being a gentleman, uh, of having a career, and of being worthy of Estella when he sees us being his future wife. Yeah, good. I'm glad the word gentleman got in introduced here. Oh, Martha, mm -hmm. Martha, do you have a uh, something to say? Um, he, um, I felt he was pretty mean to. Uh, what what what's the girl's name? I I can't remember. All of a sudden, <laughs> Biddy. Uh, Biddy. Biddy, he was really rude to her. You know, he was his class was coming out, his new class, his new planned class, and uh, and uh, he, and he, and he was not too nice to Joe either. Yeah, I agree, Karen. Yeah, if we stick with your current question, which is how do his changed expectations change Pip? I was looking through this section, just this section, after he gets his money, after he gets to London, and the words used to describe Pip, lonely, shame, regret, guilt, remorse. I mean, I think that he has become even more discontented and just not fitting in. And that struck me more than it has in previous readings. Um, since Margaret brought up a very key word, gentlemen, I will ask a question, which is, define a gentleman. <laughs> and I will say, I will say, uh, you could probably do a full semester course of Victorian novels, <laughs> which are wrestling with this question. It's a big, big issue. The 18th century novel uh, was much clearer. A gentleman was uh, somebody who had grandparents who were gentle people 
and had an income and landed property. Okay, Barbara. Well, you also have to take into account what he's encountering. I mean, Bentley is supposedly a gentleman, right? And yeah. he is he is also um encountering the coldness of all that the loneliness as you said the you know he's he is finding that um it's not it's, what is that song that they sing at the forge all the time that um what's his oh, or it comes in uh, out of time but, Clem. yeah they aren't all standing around and being chummy with one another there is a real coldness about this life that um he is slowly learning about and such divisions you know we have all that information about jagger and jaggers is uh you know fulfills a very specific slot and and does only the things that he wants to do as far as the law is concerned what I'm trying to show here I don't have my Oxford English Dictionary with me here in Seattle but I would bet that it probably the entry on gentleman takes up a couple of columns it's a, it's a complex term that lots of people saw differently uh there's much dispute in the 19th century. Who's a gentleman? What is it that makes you a gentleman? Uh, is it property? Is it behavior? Is it that you don't work in any occupation where you're the other side of the counter from the customer. Uh, David, Dorothy has her hand up. Okay, Dorothy. First of all, I'd like to answer the question of the lady who wanted to know where we are, November 26th up to book two, chapter four. Secondly, yes, this add something very important which sim which uh, pip seems to have overlooked he concentrates on what you have as 1d the man who does not engage in a menial occupation completely ignoring c2 a man whose conduct 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 conforms to a high standard of correct behavior. I'm remembering the quote, a gentleman is never rude except on purpose. And I've noted in chapter 14, he's become a snob and we really don't like what we see in him. That, that's yeah. all. I think what he's doing is he's uh, doing what he thinks a gentleman is supposed to do. Um, which le leads me to the question, where has Pip gotten his ideas of what a gentleman is and does? Wayne? Oh, yes. I'm going to say something maybe off the wall. I guess last week, at a hearing, two U.S. senators were ready to square off. Does anyone remember that? Yes. Yeah. One of them said, uh, will you come outside with me and settle this? <laughs> and that's a remnant of gentlemanly behavior that we tend to forget. And <laughs> it's another, just another anecdote. If you remember in Pride and Prejudice, poor Mrs. Bennett falls into tears 
when she realizes that Lydia has run away. And she says, uh, Mr. Bennett will kill Mr. Uh, Mr. Wickham <laughs> or be killed. Yes. And she's, she's serious because Mr. Bennett is a gentleman. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Dueling even lasted somewhere into mid-century yes. Victorian mm -hmm. life, although it became rarer and rarer. But that that whole idea that a gentleman will defend his honor is big. Or his loved ones, yes. <laughs> Barbara? Yeah, well, think of where we learn about what upper the upper classes are doing nowadays. I mean, we we see them in various media shoots, right? And assume that we should dress like this or we should act like that, or that if we got the right cuisinart that we'd be, you know, perfect. And I, I it, the thing about media presentations of the upper class in the 19th century, it seems to me, is that it had, it had to, it was so filtered through so many people that the, the picture was, you know, similar to Pip's first story about going to Miss Havisham's that, you know, how everything was, um, glittery and wonderful and you know i i think that there was a lot of misconception of and well certainly still is misconception about what um people in the upper classes are doing and how they actually act if i could sing i'd sing a stands or, or two and the chorus of anything goes yeah right oh. okay um alexis yeah but dickens all the time it, it shows you how ridiculous it is because you can be a brewer and be a gentleman but you can't be a baker and be a gentleman it's so arbitrary and it's just people who know th these sort of rules that you know really make no sense and herbert to me is a gentleman in that he is he is kind. He is supposed to be helping Pip become a gentleman. And he is so very gracious when he's correcting his table manners. You know, yes. it seems sort of silly, but, you know, we really don't put the knife into our mouth. And, you know, he's, he's laughing and, and he's a very kind person. Yes. Um, and then you have the contrast with Pip, who has taken people who've been nothing but good to him, Biddy and Joe, and he is just so awful you know but he feels he can't be a gentleman and still be kind and consort with joe and biddy um so it, it's not you know gentle birth does nothing to you i mean a true gentleman i think is herbert pocket it's uh you know he's pip is definitely thinking well i've gone up several steps on the social rank ladder and I have to look down on and condescend to these people that I used to be on equal terms with. Mm -hmm. uh, where does where does Pip get his ideas about how a gentle a gentleman behaves? Who has he seen? that counts as gentlemen. John? Well, that's a very good question because I, I don't think the concept of gentleman has fully formed in the mind of young Pip. Uh, yeah. And, and, and so part of what he's learning is that there is a class system. He knows intuitively that there are class differences. And, uh, but the concept of gentleman is, is something that is given to him when Jaggers makes his proposition. And so I, I, I think that Pip, Pip is ignorant of the concept, but is growing and learning about it. He does have some, and I think Barb's 
uh, reference to the media that Pip's ideas about class come through popular culture, they come through the, the different media, through uh, folklore. Uh, when he goes to visit Miss Havisham, he's learning about class differences, but he has never been exposed to class before in that immediate way. And I was gonna, if, if I could take, take the liberty of saying a few words about the class system in 19th century England, early 19th century England. And this is, it's, it's a little bit schematic, but I think it's a useful way to at least begin thinking about the concept of gentlemen. Um, the, at the top of the class structure would be the aristocracy, people who are born into the aristocracy and who inherit a title. Hold and, on a moment, John. Yes. Ava, could you give me the slide on social rank? Ah, good. You have one. Okay. Go ahead, John. Um, so you're born into the aristocracy. And there are a few lower ranks within the aristocracy, the baronet and the knight that... Uh, are sort of above the middle class, but not not quite of the top aristocracy. Then there is the gentry, and the gentry is the non-titled land-owning class. Then there is the professional class, and is it possible to be a gentleman and to be a member of the professional class. What are the professional classes in 19th century England? They are uh, the clergy, uh, they are the military. Medicine is perhaps a profession that uh, stands uh, in, a, in a different relationship to the class system. Are doctors uh, members of the upper class, or are they members of the middle class? The, it's a it's a question that is in. Are professors or uh, professors? Uh, where do professors? Uh, and what about lawyers? And I think you know we need to go back and think about the uh, about characters in this novel. And uh, I'll ask a question but I don't want to try and answer it quite yet because I want to finish my my little uh, talk about the class system. Is Jaggers a gentleman? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a very interesting question. So then uh, the aristocracy, uh, the gentry, the professional class, which sort of stands to the side of, of, of this, and, and we need to come back to it because there are there are important members of the prof of the professional class, and there are less important professional class members. Then the middle class, which is uh, a, a giant range, and then the working class, and then what I think of as the underclass, people who are uh, uh, the unemployed, uh, the, the the wretched of the earth to use a, a, a different term so that's that's roughly the the system i think uh with within which we are uh reading about this novel and all of those classes are represented in today's section uh, not necessarily by a character but by the aspirations or references. And uh, I, I forget who it was who, who talked about the difference between being a brewer and uh, a baker. And there's there's actually a, a, a passage where that is uh, yeah. uh, it's it's in the uh, it's in chapter 22, which is toward the end or chapter, I think that's chapter three. We can keep a gentleman. Yes. A gentleman can keep a brewery, but a gentleman and, cannot keep an inn. Uh, it's it's Herbert's explanation to Pip about the history of Miss Havisham. 
And uh, a, a basic concept to thinking about class in the 19th century is the difference between the idea of station, that is of your class position as station, which is another term that is used for, for social class. It's an older, older term, but the idea of station is uh, connected to, the, to the, a system of hierarchy in which you are born into a station and you remain in that station. Uh, and what's happening in the 19th century is that you have class mobility starting to happen, the possibility of changing, uh, changing one's social class, of moving. Uh, so the, the idea of station and the new concept of uh, mobility of, of social class through marriage, through wealth, through education, through uh, professional training, the, these issues are in, in, in competition and in fluidity at this, at this point. And Pip is learning about them. So when Herbert explains to uh, Pip about Miss Havisham's past, he says, her father, this is in chapter 22, her father was a country gentleman, notice that word, down in your part of the world and was a brewer. I don't know why it should be a crack thing to be a brewer, but it is indisputable that while you cannot possibly be genteel and bake, you may be as genteel as never was and brew. You see it every day. And then Pip says, yet a gentleman may keep a public house. May he, said I. Not on any account, returned Herbert, but to a public house may keep a gentleman. And there's a there's a joke in that in that response, of course. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I there are these uh, in some ways arbitrary divisions. Why can a baker not be a gentleman, but a brewer can? Um, someone has decided that. So it's it's also interesting, I think, to go back to the world that Pip came from, that is the village, and to think about how class distinctions are marked in that uh, world as well. So, um, David, I believe, yeah, Kathy and Maxine had their hands up. Okay, I will say a couple of things before I get to them. Uh, one of the things we notice is how Pip's expectations change the way people see and treat Pip in the village, uh, Mr. Trab and so on. Uh, what was the other thing I had in mind? Oh, all through the latter part of the century, in literature, you've got people dealing with new men. Earlier, it had been if somebody came onto the scene, you knew who he was, or at least who his family was. And suddenly, we've got all these people like Mr. Myrtle in the Little Dorrit, or Ferdinand Lopez in Trollope's The Prime Minister, Nobody knows where they come from. Nobody knows who they are. Can you trust them? Uh, it was very unsettling for the Victorians. Okay, uh, Kathy. I was just gonna say, <clears throat> when John said that uh, mobility, you know, is a newly introduced thing. I think the whole book is about mobility because that's what's happening to Pip. You know, he's gone from rags to not necessarily riches, but he is moving up in class. And I think the other thing, when you talk about the brewer, <clears throat> you know, having being part of a class, um, <clears throat> it's very interesting to me that Mrs. Haversham's money has come from that. 
And yet you have, you know, I remember this book from seventh grade when I read it because I loved Mrs. Faversham. I just loved her. And what I loved about her was she's surrounded by bugs and rats and spider <laughs> webs and the whole scene. And to me, like there's, I don't know what Dickens is trying to say about this, but she has class because her, you know, her father was a brewer. But look what's happened to her. And, you know, obviously she's meant this to occur. It's a, a point, uh, you know, and have Estella get even. But, you know, I just wanted to say those two things. Yeah. And also the other thing I want to say about Pip is uh, what he, in this second stage, what he's doing is bankrupting himself. <laughs> he's not good with money, you know, and he... He uh, that that becomes one of the flaws. I mean, the major flaw, really. Um, so well, he has no practice with money. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, but he knew he was. Yeah, but no practice. But he also knew exactly that he was blowing it um, all along, and and he has no one to help him because Jagger says that's not my job. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh... One of the questions that I think on the gentleman front is how much money is enough money to make you a gentleman? A big brewer makes a lot of money. Um, under King Edward VII, uh, peerage titles were given to a number of brewers and people referred to the House of Lords as being made up of the beerage. Okay. Uh, um, Max David, it's Maxine had her hand raised and then Barbara, uh, and then Rick also has his hand raised. So Maxine, yeah. Barbara, and Rick. Yeah, Maxine. Um, to me, the, the most honorable character in the uh, story so far is Joe when he refuses to take money to... Uh, liberate uh, Pip from his bondage. Um, he has a code of conduct above money. And th th that's the irony. He is always thought of as the underclass. He is an honorable person, whereas Pip's notion of, of being a gentleman has no ethical or, or uh, content. It's pure yeah. matter of snobbishness. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Barbara? Yeah, well, it, let's just kind of to tie this together a little bit. If we're going to have social mobility and people are going to be able to move up and not be fixed in their position, in their status, then these upper class people who have never, were not expected to work, were not expected to study anything, um, and were expected to have servants and so on to take care of them, it's going to start to crack that system too, isn't it? Yes. Uh... Ava, can you give me the slide on Dinah Craig? Yes, one second. There. A uh, book that got talked about a great deal in its time was John Halifax Gentleman, which is sort of high class Horatio Alger. Uh, John Halifax starts as a poor boy and through pluck and luck he works his way up and he's not raised as a gentleman. He builds a mill and when he gets in a disagreement with the local landowner, the local landowner diverts the stream that makes the wheel, mill wheel go. So John Halifax gets a steam engine. 
And in a way, the uh, Dinah Mulock Craig is uh, saying, yes, he's a gentleman in dealing with somebody where a lot of people would say, no, he's not a gentleman. There's a good article available on the Victorian web, which I refer to there. The other place you might have heard of, of Dinah Mulock Craig is she was the author of The Little Lame Prince, uh, which you may have read when you were a child. I think it is still in print. She wrote quite a few novels, quite a few children's books. And as you see, she was taken quite seriously in her time. But uh, this whole business of who is a gentleman, what disqualifies you, what qualifies you, was one that was discussed endlessly. Can you cease to be regarded as a gentleman? In a melodrama, somebody might say, sir, you are no gentleman. Uh, okay, have I uh, omitted somebody now who had a hand up? I don't see one. Um, Rick has his hand up. Rick, okay. Ahead. Shoot. Yeah, um, I think actually, while there's a lot of classes, there is also a caste dividing line so that uh, everybody above a certain point is a gentleman and everybody below a certain point is not a gentleman, but there are many different ranks of gentlemen and ranks of non-gentlemen. And my, um, my best analogy for this actually contradicts something somebody said before. You're, if you're in the military, you're not a gentleman. You're in the, if you're in the military and you're an officer, you're a gentleman. Right. If you're a non-com, you're not a gentleman. And it is a caste system specifically designed as such. It right. is the military right. intends it that way. They have different officers clubs and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. In, in the, in the government, one. government right. kind of work and in a bank, the, the, um, the clerks in the bank are not gentlemen the officers in the bank are gentlemen and that's uh that's just the way it works and in fact when i was in the government there you there used to be a, a dividing line which they're trying to erase which is a very good thing between clerical and professional staff and in doctors and nurses is another one the doctors are in one caste and the nurses are in another caste, but the nurses are working their way into the into the doctor, into the officer class. They're crossing a line when they do that. There really is a line. And one of the lines in our society today is the line between people who can work at home or wherever they want to and people who have to go out to a job. And we really found that out during, during the uh, pandemic. Yeah. You know, uh, they're they're really so. This is the important thing. Is this this fellow, this fellow in the story is working his way from being in the lower caste across that line to be in the upper caste, and once he's in that upper caste, which in this case dresses in for in differently and everything else, which they do in the army too, for that matter. As soon as he's in the upper upper caste, he's got a considerable amount of maneuverability through that class, but he can't get born differently. We know that. But beyond that, you know, he, he can work his way up in that cast, but he's in the cast. You follow me? And then the very poor people are still in the lower, are in the lower cast, but so are the working people who work with their hands and with animals. They're still in that lower cast, but clearly among them, they make all kinds of distinctions within that caste. So, well, there, there we are. That's kind of my take on it. There's an interesting uh, accommodation during World War I in the British Army. The 
junior officers who were from the public schools and were traditional gentlemen were getting killed off at such a rate that people were being given jobs who were just as they would have said, not quite a gentleman, you know. And they were referred to as temporary gentlemen. And after the war, they sort of lost that status. There are a couple of books written about somebody who was an officer during the war and then had to drop back. It's... It, it's curious where you've got rules and then exceptions get made. Alexis? Yeah, and then there's that, that unwritten code of conduct. A gentleman does not have to pay his tailor, but he has to pay his gambling debts. Yes. And then there's that wonderful quote that I, I, I can't remember who said it. I, I don't know why, but it's, um, a gentleman need not know Latin, but at least he should have forgotten it. I mean, <laughs> it's just like, there's this whole set of rules that if you're a gentleman, you know what the rules are. And see, that's the problem with Pip. He's not sure. He doesn't know what the rules are. He doesn't know all this unspoken stuff. You know, you meet, we have our first meeting with Drummel. And, and you know he's 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 brutish, but he's a gentleman, you know. So uh, I I don't know. There's so many things that you have to know, and I, I, I don't know how you're born knowing. And he doesn't even know the silverware to keep the knife out of his mouth, let alone if he had to go to a dinner and really know the silverware. And as far as the professional classes, this is early nineteenth century. A doctor would would never have been considered yeah. uh, anyone you sat mm. down to dinner with, right. you know, and, and it would be a very lucky lawyer who who made it up the ranks to the dinner invitations. Um, they were servants. The Duke would never have anyone like a you know, an accountant, a, a doctor, a lawyer, they they would not make the invitation list. Yep. I've occasionally thought that a significant part of the British upper class education was teaching people how to be rude. <laughs> uh, let me think, where do I want to go? Um, Kathy, um, get your hand raised, David? Kathy, yes. I wanted to say that, you know, education is also in England, uh, you know, a, a caste because if you go to the public schools, which are, you know, it's like crazy, they're not really public schools, but um, you're, you know, you're of that, you're of that class where just going to, you know, what we would call public schools, like the down and out schools that, you know, weren't really even in many ways in Dickens times very developed at all. Um, you were of the lower class and that, that, <clears throat> that, went on forever i mean you could never escape that you know unless somehow you you know you got into oxford from some dinky school and and that's really true in english society still and also accent um you know which isn't really mentioned much in this book but um you know you had a certain accent when you were poor and depending, I mean, even, you know, having a Northern accent, um, you know, was not as good as if you came from the South and you came from London. And then, you know, that particular strat stratus, there's so many, you know, ways you can't go. <laughs> and, and yet Pip is doing this with, you know, no direction. One of the places like where, the social, do it. where the social system was being upset was with manufacturing. Yeah, exactly. And you have these guys who have become filthy rich. Are they gentlemen? Well, Mr. Bounderby in hard times is not, but at least one of the, the hero of Mrs. Gaskell's North and South is. You get... Uh, there's an adjustment going on, which is not entirely comfortable for uh, anybody who's living in the system. 
Glenna. Yeah, I was just going to say, pursuant to what was said earlier about regional accents, um, well, clearly Pip must have had to um, work on his purifying his English to have any aspirations of becoming a gentleman. But it also reminded me during the impeachment hearings a couple of years ago, we had this woman from the north of England, Fiona Hill, who said that she came to this country because with her northern accent, she knew it would limit her ability to move up the ranks in the UK. Yeah, good one. John? Yes, I wanted to uh, follow up on that uh, question about accent and language because uh, it's it's very true that uh, the accent that one has is uh, something that reveals one's origins and therefore one's social class. And uh, although there's not a lot of attention paid to accent in this novel, there is some, so um, I'm wondering if people can remember places where a character's accent indicates that that character's social class. Joe. Joe is is the predominant one. Mm -hmm. One of Jagger's clients. Yes. Jagger's clients. I'm still interested in the question of whether Jaggers is a gentleman or not. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I'm interested in Pip because Pip is from very humble origins. He's from, he's the adopted child of, uh, if we use that term, of a, of a blacksmith. He's trained to be a blacksmith. What accent do we imagine that Pip has? Are there any indications of what Pip's accent is like. Well, There's, he doesn't talk, he doesn't talk like Joe. He, he does <laughs> not talk like Joe. And he, he didn't talk like Jack Joe when he was little there either. Estella mocks him for his vocabulary. His vocabulary? That's not quite the same thing as accent. No, but close. It's it's language use. So uh, several people have their hands up. So, uh, uh, yeah, Alexis. Yeah, I wanted to go back to what you were saying about the manufacturing class that were coming in, you know, with the Industrial Revolution, and, and they were really uh, becoming quite wealthy. They really undermined the whole British economic system because they didn't want their sons to grow up and get into the business. They wanted their sons to be gentlemen. So they tried to buy their way into the public schools with their sons, tried to marry them to impoverished uh, ladies whose brothers and fathers were titled, you know. And so the, the businesses did not, uh, it did not become a dynasty, you know, such as we have here. Uh, with manufacturing in the United States, you know, uh, they, they didn't want their sons to work. They wanted their sons to be gentlemen, and that really sort of undermined <laughs> the entire system. There was the line that it takes three generations to make a gentleman. That's right. Um, Wayne. Oh, yes, on the question of accent, uh, just going back to the question of accent for a minute, one of the fascinating things about the first chapter is that question because we get a sense of uh, Magwitch's accent, but little Pip speaks perfectly, a bit formally. Mm -hmm. And there, I think that's a very interesting choice on Dickens' part. He doesn't try to imitate his younger self, or that Mr. Mr. Pip doesn't try to imitate his younger self. He must have had an accent back then, but he doesn't now. He does, however, uh, give us an indication of Magwitch's accent. 
It's an, a very interesting point of view. Well, the, in the 19th century novel, the only heroes who have accents are from north of the border. Mm -hmm. Scott is willing to have characters who are heroes who speak Scottish dialect. But even as low as Oliver Twist, if you're going to be the hero of the book, you don't have an accent. Um, Irene and Carolyn have the Ke Irene, Carolyn, and Rick have their hands raised. Yeah. Uh, hi. I just wanted to pose the question. Um, from what we're saying just now, it's made me realize that probably this novel, more than any other Dickens novel, is concerned with the issue of class and what makes someone a gentleman. Uh, I don't think I'd registered that until this discussion. I just wondered if that was something other people were aware of. It obviously comes into a lot of Dickens novels and makes me wonder about himself, uh, you know, how much he suffered from being considered not the right class as he grew up. Uh, so, because it seems to have infiltrated so many of his novels, but it seems to be the dominant theme here. Just a question there. Well, I think at this point in his life, he's really looking back and questioning some of the values that he himself had. Uh, Rick, you had you had your hand up early and we're waving, so let's give get you in this. Caroline? Okay, I got it. <laughs> Forgot to use the mouse, <laughs> trying to use my finger, like I think it's a telephone or something. Any, anyway, uh, the interest, it's that the, Pip in particular has a conception of a gentleman, what a gentleman is. And clearly to him, there is, there is one line drawn between gentlemen and people who aren't gentlemen. He's not differentiating the blacksmith from any anybody else who's you know in the non gentleman category, um, and he, he he's it's to him there really is only one line. He's not thinking about dukes and lords and kings and anybody else that he couldn't be. He's thinking of what somebody could be if they have the capacity to do it and develop the and develop into it, and in this case. You know, for him, it's just, it, it really is one clear distinction, one bar that he wants to go across. And once he's across that bar and he's convinced he's across it, then he moves into a whole nother set of ambitions that isn't about being a gentleman anymore. It's within the whole gentleman category. And I think that's important because um, when he looks around him, when he's still living in his home area and with the, you know, and the family and all of the people around and all of that stuff, uh, he he feels like like none of them are okay, and he wants to be okay. And mm -hmm. the way he gets to be okay is somehow to be a gentleman. And then he feels like the blacksmith any longer is not okay, and he has to talk. Um, Biddy, is that her name, into helping the blacksmith to overcome these things that are not gentlemanly with him because he really he really loves the blacksmith and wants him to be able to be a worthwhile person, which he has this dude, you know, he's kind of a snob that way, somebody pointed out, that he doesn't think you're, a, you're really a fully worthwhile person unless you somehow have those characteristics that he's he's identifying as a gentleman. Yeah, well, he wants to be able to take Joe with him. Yeah. That's right. oh. And he can't do that. Joe yeah. can't be with him if Joe isn't a gentleman. But that's not true because he could bring him along in a subaltern capacity. Um, but he, that's not what he wants to do. He doesn't, he wants, he wants the blacksmith, he loves to be as good as he is. Kathy, I think you are next. 
All right, I'll just say one quick thing relative to John's question about the accent. You know, I've listened to Great Expectations because I can't see well enough to read, like maybe 10 times. I, I just, it's my go-to thing to meditate. And um, it's rather murky to me. How does, because Pip leaves on this journey when he's relatively young, who is guiding his transition? And there must have been a problem with his diction and his accent. I mean, was there someone guiding him? It doesn't really, unless I missed it, talk about his further education. One would think if these monies were available, he would have been put in some kind of school where he would have learned to speak better, for lack of a better word. And um, so remind me, does he get first? Because essentially his education was from Biddy. Well, I would say one of the things about Dickens that is very effective in all of his books, there's always a fairy tale element. Mm. And you can find it in various ways in this book. True. And the fairy tale element means you don't have to be too realistic sometimes. So we can skip over the question of okay. <laughs> how people learn to stop betraying himself every time he opened his mouth. Uh, he picks up some by, by talking to Herbert, mm -hmm. Herbert's father, and uh, Jaggers, I guess, probably also sets him an example. He was a quick study. Yeah. Like Dickens, actually. Yes. So it's Kathy, Wayne, Margaret, and then John and Alexis. Um, I was just going to say that, um, you know, back, uh, back to money with, with Pip, that Pip, because he didn't really have any, you know, to me, he didn't have guidance. Like Herbert was supposed to be there to be guidance. Jagger couldn't. Um, you know, he does, like, he does the best he can. Like, he hires this... I don't know what you would call him, Livery, the, the guy that, you know, was supposed to be like the servant for a day when Joe comes, you know, that's, you know, he, he's not sure exactly what to do because there's really no, and, and he buys too many suits. He joins clubs that he can't afford. And I think, you know, it's just comes from, you know, he's doing the best he can with no direction. Yeah. I mean, Herbert does warn him. But yeah, that's all. Yeah, it's uh, and nobody gives him a handbook on how to be a gentleman. And uh, Wayne? He's, working, he's making up a definition as he goes along. Wayne. Okay, it strikes me when Pitt tries to raise Joe. Joe really does not cooperate. There are signs that Joe is really pretty smart, but he doesn't care anything about being a gentleman. <laughs> and that really adds so much to Joe's appeal. Yeah. And Pitt, of course, can't understand it, but he does. <laughs> yes. Thanks. Joe has self-respect because he does what he does well. Yes. And, uh, the whole business of uh, oh, a gentleman is idle is uh, not something that Joe cottons to. Margaret? Thanks. I'm, I just unmuted. I'm glad I came in after Wayne because I want to thank Wayne for for uh, uh, saying that story, the, jilt, the jilting of Granny Weatherall was interesting in relation to Miss Havisham in uh, our discussion that at the last time. And I really enjoyed that story, Wayne, by Catherine and Porter. And it shows how obsessive the character was. And it seemed to be, uh, it seems to be a theme throughout 
uh, great expectations also. But what I wanted to really say, so thank you, Wayne, about that. But the, the what I wanted to say was uh, Joe's signature expression is the whole to get all together. I mean to say, I mean to say, and he says it many, many times. And for that, I catch the accent and it dominates whatever Joe says, I mean to say. And what I mean to say right now <laughs> is that um, the the language is in their their actions. So uh, how they deal with each other, how they are physically in in the room or in in your vision of the story of them. So that uh, when I saw the dramatization or the 1946 film, I just watched the Alec Guinness film, the Alec Guinness scenes as as Herbert Pocket, and he was so perfect in that role as uh, as uh, Pip's mentor, really his his equal and mentor in that uh, in that introduction to London. So uh, and also in watching the the film in 1946. Uh, and having just read the scenes again, <laughs> I missed certain things like they shook hands when uh, when they were just going into the apartment and uh, that sort of thing. And also when they tried to open the door, the door was stuck. And so yes. uh, Herbert Pocket has to, uh, to lean against it, but also Pip was against it and they both fell back laughing. And so that was the first bond between them, laughter. So which, which Dickens is so attuned to with his sense of humor that keeps us chuckling even when we're discussing this now. So um, I'm all around the place. Uh, what, I, what I mean to say is uh, that that's Joe's signature term, I mean to say. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Okay, before I call John, I'm going to make one <laughs> remark. Uh, don't go out and read John Halifax, gentlemen. You can it, it, don't put it on your bucket list. It's uh, it's interesting, but it's not it's not a great novel. Okay, John. Thanks, David. Um, the the question of Pip's accent interests me greatly, and Wayne pointed to something very important that in the opening scenes the convict's accent is marked mm -hmm. and we know from his accent that he is from a lower class um, pips when pip speaks his english is standard english which doesn't really quite fit with his origins in the lower class, in, in the working class. But there is one place in early in the novel, in chapter seven, where Pip's accent is revealed in a very interesting way. And it's not when he speaks, but when he writes. And I'm referring to the letter that he writes to Joe oh. in chapter seven. And it's a, it's a wonderful little thing to look at. If you can find it in, I have a different edition, but it's early in chapter seven of the novel. And it's Pip's first attempt at writing. And since this is a novel of education, an important part of Pip's education is becoming literate. Mm -hmm. And so if anyone has a page number that you can refer me to, I, I would like to read that, uh, that letter that Pip writes and ask a couple of questions about it. So do you have a page number for me? In my book, it's page 40, but that's... Um, it's early in chapter I'm seven. Mine is 45 in uh, the Puffin classic. Yeah, Penguin edition is 40, page 45. Okay, so I'm going to read it uh, aloud to you. But you need to see it in order to understand the humor. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yes. 
So there are capital letters that are interspersed in a sort of random way. My dear Joe, I hope you are cur white well. I hope I shall soon be able for to teach you Joe, and then we shall be so glad. And when I am printed to you, Joe, what larks? And believe me. And then there's a very curious closing on this. And I, I, I want to come back to that. But notice, before I talk about that, notice that Pip drops his H's, I hope you, this is phonetic spelling, Pip, Pip is spelling phonetically. So he's using his recently acquired literacy in order to represent his accent. And he says, I hope, so he's dropping his H's and then he says, uh, uh, I shall soon be able. So he adds his H where there is no H in, unless you have an accent. So Pip has an accent. That's the accent that he is born with or that he acquires in his, in his early years. And he represents it here. So why is it that in the scenes between the convict and young Pip, that Pip's speech is not, does not reveal an accent? And the answer to that question is that it's not the young Pip who is writing this narrative. It's the older Pip. Yeah. And the older Pip sanitizes the young Pip's spoken English. Yeah, he sure does. And so uh, you need to remember that this is a retrospective narrative and that the Pip at the end of the story, that is the Pip who looks back and tells the story of his childhood all the way up to the end of the novel, is the one who is doing the writing. So his representations of people will reflect his values at the end of that career. So he makes the young Pip sound a, like he's from a different class. And that is something that is hard to keep in your mind as you read the story, because so much of the story is focalized through the young Pip. And we can see the young Pip in many ways very clearly. And the older Pip who is narrating it can see some of the mistakes that the young Pip is making. But there may be other ways in which the older Pip who's telling the story turns things a little bit in his own favor. And I think the language is, is one, the accent, the uh, uh, sanitizing, I've called it, of Pip's accent. But I think Pip as a character, as he's moving through the world and comes into contact with people of higher class or higher station or, or higher caste, can't help but reveal his class origins through his speech. And when Joe's accent shows, I mean to say, or even his little expressions like what larks, or thank you, he, he says thank you instead of thank you. Um, those are ways of indicating that Joe is lower class and his language reveals his class position. So that's one point that I wanted to make. But do you know how to read that final uh, 
I N capital F X N pip. If you have that, uh, do you know how to read that phonetically? In affection. It's in F action. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. So he's, he's, uh, it, it's a little bit hard to construe, but that's what he is trying to say. But I think Dickens, remember Dickens is the one who's writing this, is revealing something else that is going on. And there's a pun, a play on words, because I N F X N can also be read as infection. <laughs> And, and the pun on infection is, I think, an important one because literacy is one of the things that distinguishes Pip from Joe. Mm -hmm. Joe is, is a wonderful character in many ways, but he has his limits and he is not literate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that will move Pip away from Joe and become a barrier between us. <laughs> and that, that barrier is a kind of infection, is that Pip is moving up into a literate class. He's moving up into becoming a gentleman. And Joe will never move in that way, as people have said. Okay, Alexis. Yeah, just to get back to your point about um, his education, it's it, it's a minor point, but he is, quote, reading with Dr., with Mr. Pocket. And, and Mr. Pocket is running a small school because also reading there is Drummle and Startup and, oh, some, yeah. one other boy, I think. You know, and that's what you do in England. You read. If you yeah. go to Oxford, you're not studying history. You're reading history. And if he were to say, go to the law like Jaggers, there's no law school. You go and read and study with whoever a practicing attorney is. Same way for medicine. You know, me medical schools are in their infancy if they even exist. You know, so reading is what he's doing. They don't talk much about what Mr. Pocket does, but he spends a couple of years reading. So, yeah, very if, good point. If we uh, could, I'd, I'd like to, to a lot of these <laughs> is north of the border. Scotland had public school system that was really public. Scotland had med school, which was where you went if you really wanted to learn anything about doctoring. I think they had law schools, I'm not so sure, but uh, that was, <coughs> it was quite different than England. Uh, if if I could, I'd I'd like to say a little bit about the pockets, or at least to ask you about that, because in terms of of Pip's education, yes, Jaggers knows a tutor for Pip, and he sends him to Matthew Pocket, who is the father of Herbert Pocket, and uh, the whole section that has to do with the pockets is, it's a curious section. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what people think the point of the pocket section. Uh, it was part of today's reading assignment. What, what is there for? What, what is the pocket section doing? You're getting someplace I was gonna go. Okay, good, David. I'm, I'm sorry to, <laughs> but it has to do with education. Yeah, okay. I was also going to ask the question, apart from Pip, who else in the book has great expectations? The actual phrase is used a number of times. Irene are... has her hand up and Kathy has her hand up. Okay, Irene. Right, well, to answer that last question, uh, the one with great expectations is Herbert with his idea that he can, through insurance and getting a little capital, make himself really wealthy and get up in life. 
uh, because he's seen that his own father is struggling financially, so he knows how important money is, but he has strange ideas of how exactly he's going to make the money. I yes. think we'll find out later that it's not as straightforward as he thinks to, to make the money he, he intends. Uh, to come back to the, the pockets generally, um, I think I would emphasize even more than you have before that Matthew Pocket, actually, I think he was at Oxford. He, had re he was very well educated, but had not managed to use that education as a way of making money, which is why he's, uh, uh, that plus his, his and his wife's inability to run a household uh, in any reasonable way means that they're never going to be able to exist on his income. Uh, because he, they're not overseeing the the the, the house the wife is incapable of overseeing the household and making sure that they don't overspend. Uh, so there's all kinds of things wrong with the household, which means that Matthew, although he realizes the flaws, can't do anything about it because his wife is his social superior. He is married above him, and this yes. makes it very difficult for him to challenge her, even though she is absolutely incapable of doing anything of use at all. I think that's probably enough I could to say for me to say thank you. The whole passage about <clears throat> her background is very interesting. The only daughter of a certain quite accidental deceased knight who had invented for himself a conviction that his deceased father would have been made a baronet, but for somebody's determined opposition arising out of entirely personal motives. I forget whose, if I ever knew, the sovereigns, the prime ministers, the Lord Chancellors, the Archbishop of Canterbury's, anybody's, and attacked himself on to the nobles of the earth in right of this quite suppositious fact. I believe he had been knighted himself for storming the English grammar at the point of the pen in a desperate address engrossed on vellum on the occasion of the laying of the first stone of some building or other and for handling some royal personage, either the trowel or the mortar. Ah. Oh. So his daughter grew up highly ornamental but perfectly helpless and useless. In the first bloom of her youth, she had encountered Mr. Pocket, who was also in the first bloom of youth, and had not quite decided whether to mount to the wool sack or roof himself in with a mitre. To become a highly successful lawyer or rise in the church. And... Uh, Somewhere in there, it talks about Mrs. Pocket having great expectations. A lot of people in the book have expectations of one sort or another that are not fulfilled. You may be able to think of some others. Okay, uh, Kathy? I just wanted to respond to uh, the question about the pockets. The pockets are actually, in many ways, uh, Pip's rival, because they, you know, they were, you know, when you're first introduced to the pockets, they're all sitting around Mrs. Haversham and the mice and the spiders and the <laughs> and the wedding cake and the bad dress, wedding dress, and um, you know, they're being, you know. Uh, falsely friendly because they want to inherit the money from her and yes. in pep's mind and in the pocket's mind you know mrs haversham you know is the one that's uh fronted the fronted the money for pip to be a gentleman um but at the same time uh H henry is a it's henry right Herbert. Herbert, excuse me. Herbert, they, you know, Pip, they're really good friends. And, you know, Herbert doesn't know how to handle money either. He's in terrible debt. So Pip is always such a good friend to him. I mean, even trying to figure out, you know, a way. I mean, he does. He funds some, I just got to this, some scheme where Herbert won't know that, you know, Herbert will eventually have a business. But back to the pockets. 
you know, their expectations are they're going to get Mrs. Haversham's money and it's in the way, which is ironic. And, you know, they're being very nice to Pip, too, at the same time. Yeah. Yes, they're definitely people who think that money is a reasonable expectation. And Estella also have expectations. Right. Right. Uh, Ava, can you uh, give me the slide about Bildung's Roman? Yes, thanks. I just thought I would get that word. David, there. Wayne has his hand raised. Okay, Wayne. Well, I this is just, I thought the pocket scene is it wonderfully comic and there's also a hint here we talk about so much about class but who is really in power yeah uh -huh. they find the cook passed out cold on the kitchen floor uh that's often left out of movies sadly and she was going to sell butter that's what they did is sell food to vendors and make a little money on the side <laughs> but that's that's all <laughs> Yeah. I first ran across the term Bildungsroman uh, from Professor Jerome Buckley at Harvard, who wrote a book on the Bildungsroman and, uh, Roman and taught a course on it, for which I graded. But uh, it seems to have started with Goethe. Anyhow, enough. Okay, I have a Another question, which I want to ask before it gets too late. Uh, anybody want to tell me who George Barnwell is? Wayne? Well, George Barnwell, George Barnwell is the protagonist in a very well-known tragedy in the 18th century. The yes. London Merchant. The London Merchant. In fact, I believe every Easter, the apprentices got off and were expected to att to attend a performance of the London Merchant. <laughs> With their masters. And actually, it's actually a pretty good play. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I would say that's exaggerating, but as I haven't, <laughs> haven't reread it in 60 years, uh, the... Ava, can you give me that slide, the, the George Barnwell slide? Oh, yes, thanks. Uh, that century was not a great century for playwrights, although the, the Beggar's Opera is a wonderful work, but uh, Sarah Millwood I assume is the best part in it. The play was revived at Vassar with uh, Meryl Streep when she was an undergraduate. Oh. Uh, it can may give you some sort of idea. Sarah Millwood sucks in George Barnwell, uh, a country boy, and keeps coming up with emergencies where only he can save her by coming up with money. George has a key to his master's shop, his master's goldsmith. And so first he robs his master. And then when that money runs out, uh, Millwood needs more. And she's discovered that uh, George has a rich uncle in the suburbs. Who, whose heir he will be, and then she decides they needn't wait for nature to take its course. So, like Lady Macbeth, she sends George out to do in his uncle. Uh, the play ends with uh, George and Millwood both going to the gallows. Uh, supposed to be a moral lesson. Uh, Charles Lamb called it a nauseous sermon. Um, 
David, Rick has his hand up. Okay. Yeah, I am. Um, I was uh, getting back to this book. I was struck with how, how when Pip went to London, so many things were dingy and so few things seemed like what he would be expecting to find in a per, in a world of gentlemen it was right, right that he was stepping down as opposed to up in terms of of sort of living gracefully compared with a with with where he was coming from and uh what are what what do you think dickens wanted us to conclude from all of that uh, down at the heel stuff that that he got that uh, Pip got into when he went to London instead of somehow finding himself occasionally in a uh, a nice uh, uh, gathering of 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 comfortable well educated persons doing something or uh, you know he didn't seem to be moving up at all. I'll turn the question back on you. What do you think? Uh, Pip should have concluded. Well, if he's supposed to conclude anything, and that I'm not sure that he's supposed to have concluded this at this point, but I would think that he'd conclude, what have I gotten myself into? Or um, is this what I thought it would be? Or something, or, or, or else some real impatience with the whole situation. Um, the fairy tale isn't the way I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I mean, but you know, I I haven't read the rest of the book yet, and <laughs> I hope it gets better for him. <laughs> but at any rate, that I just thought that was a bit odd, and that's my it's my comment. I wonder why he had to be put through that. Why did Dickens put? put Pip through that set of experiences it was really so dingy once he got to London. Yeah. He comments on it himself. He sort of talks about how things cling to him that don't seem that seem wrong for the class he wants to be. And but he doesn't draw any conclusions. Karen? So Rick just gave me a great segue um, because I was interested in the whole concept of city in literature, particularly in Dickens. And David, at the beginning, you talked about the importance of structure in Great Expectations. And if we look at city in literature, and particularly this midsection of Great Expectations, I think there are three elements, and this is not original for me. Um, I think Bob Patton, in fact, came up with this, but city, in this text, it's a destination. It was where Pip went. He thought something magnanimous was there. It's a crossroads, and at this point, we don't know what that crossroads is yet for Pip. What will he choose? What will he learn? What will he gain? What will he lose? And it's a passageway. So I think if we conceptualize this London section midpoint uh, in those three ways, destination, crossroads, and passageway, it's motion. I mean, this is a real motion part of the structure, I think, in the novel. Um, and it's more vertical in this section, whereas the marsh section was more horizontal. So those were my thoughts about city. Good. I want to say two more things about George Barnwell. Oh my God. Uh, Dickens really leans kind of heavily on that. First, we have uh, Mr. Wopsle reading it aloud in uh, Pumbletook's parlor. Uh, aiming it at Pip, who is forced to identify himself with a, an apprentice who goes wrong. Later, 
Pip refers when he's at Pumbleton's house, refers to the Barnwell parlor. Uh, Dickens really wants that, wants you to have that in mind. I think one of the things that we miss in reading Victorian novels is the sense in which a major element of common culture in the Victorian era was the theater. No movies, no television, no, no radio, none of those things. Everybody went to the theater and an author could assume his audience knew the drama because older plays were also performed. Uh, most of the authors of the period crossed borders and did wrote plays hoping to make a mint. Uh, a lot of the novelists dramatized their own novels. You had no copyright as an author. So if you didn't dramatize your novel, somebody else would. Some of the poets wrote drama. If you want to read really dead drama, try um, Tennyson's historical plays. There's lots of people in costume standing around doing nothing. Uh, <coughs> Dickens knew a lot of people connected with the theater. A lot of his friends wrote plays. And often people who were members of the punch group. Uh, because of the way we teach things, uh, and because there were, wasn't a lot of great writing going on in the theater, this this point about the connection with the theater doesn't get made and we don't see the connections often enough. Okay, John? I wanted to pick up on Rick's excellent question and Karen's equally excellent response about Pip's movement from the country to the city and what the city is meant to be for Pip and what he discovers when he gets there. And I think Rick's observation is very correct that it's instead of it being a, um, a pleasant place full of uh, interesting, intelligent, uh, cultured people, it's, uh, it's grimy and uh, run down. The inn, Barnard's Inn, where he lodges with Herbert is, uh, uh, is not an elegant residence. Um, it, it's quite the contrary. But the important thing, one important way of, of uh, trying to understand what that move from the, from the country to the city means for Pip is that Pip is entering a more complex world than the village that he came from. And it's complex in many ways. I think it's morally complex. How to figure out what's good and bad is, is more difficult in the city. And we probably should talk and get people's reactions to Jaggers because Jaggers is the principal city figure that Pip encounters. There's also Wemmick, Will, Will, uh, Mr. Jagger's clerk, but J Wemmick hasn't yet figured in the, in the story yet, so we should leave him out. But Pip is moving from a world, if we think of Joe as the central father figure and moral guide for, for Pip in the village, um, and Joe's morality is is very simple. Lies is lies, and don't tell any more of them. Uh, and Joe is good, 
but Joe's morality is 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 too simple for the world of the city. Mm -hmm. And Jaggers is the figure of a more complex kind of morality. Um, we we first encounter him enforcing a contract with Pip. He's a man of the law, and he has a proposition to make to Pip, and uh, Pip has to agree to the terms of that contract, and Joe has to agree to the terms of that contract. And we see uh, even a kind of face-off between Joe and Jaggers, in which Joe comes off very well in some respects. But Jaggers is clearly working in a more complex moral, intellectual world than Joe is. So um, Pip is going to encounter confusing moral issues in the city that the village morality is not adequate to deal with. So what do people think about Jaggers? Can they see me if I read it? But Ava, you can close close down the share screen. Thanks. Uh, okay, Kathy. Um. Well, about Jaggers, that's really interesting. I um, you know, I, <laughs> I've read this book like a lot. Of I've read this book several times, even once when I took a class at Oxford, and I can't quite recall. Like how what happens at the end with him, but he, um, he seems to well. I, and and num number one, I think he has OCD because he keeps washing his hands over and over <laughs> again. Sorry, <laughs> and <laughs> that's not important, I'm sure. But uh, he uh, he see you know right now my impression reading this far this time is that. You know, he he's trying to help Pip, but he's trying to teach Pip that he's got to help himself. Like, you know, he's he hasn't instructed him in any of these monetary issues. And, you know, he's uh, warning him that, you know, that, that something bad is going to come. And yet, you know, he comes over to dinner uh, after, you know, sort of getting mad at Pip about you know not being in so much debt. Um, he seems he is enigmatic, and I can't. I don't really know what the mystery is yet. I don't know the answer to the mystery, but he's enigmatic to me. I want to say one thing about his washing his hands. Ah, <laughs> uh, think of Pontius Pilate. Ah, uh ah, -huh, uh -huh. yes. Uh, Thomas Dewey apparently washed his hands every time a visitor left his office. Uh, he was germphobic, but here I think Jaggers is dissociating himself from his business and from his clients. Well, yeah, he has some pretty nasty clients. Not yeah. Good. Interestingly enough, uh, his law firm, the description of it is very like one I've read of a turn of the century New York City law firm, which I th think may have been called Hummel and Howe. They were the people you went to if you were a professional criminal. And well, that fits right in. Caught. Again, we know that's who hired him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and their office was just as squalid as Jagger's. Yeah. Dan? Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the first time Pip meets Jagger's is actually at Miss Havisham's house. And he's kind of yeah. struck by the fact that Jagger's is this very professional man. And there's kind of a bit of a harsh interaction uh, to Pip by Jagger's. And then, of course, he sees him in the city and I guess he makes connections and he kind of uh, tries to put two and two together to see if Miss Havisham is his benefactor. But really, the issue with Jaggers is just the, you know, Pip sees him as this almost kind of, um, you know, I don't want to say godlike figure, but very kind of 
authority on city matters, things that are in this kind of respectful world of gentlemen and 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 the world that a candidate wants to be a part of. And, and Pip is very, you know, he respects them to a degree, but he also, um, as we kind of learn, is going to to not necessarily trust him, you know, as a as a as a friend or, or even a confidant, even though uh he's very um very uh you know, gracious toward him and kind of deferential in a lot of ways. So it is it is kind of interesting that Pip meets him first in the country, in the village, and then kind of transfers that, you know, that under, that uh, relationship to the city. Yeah. Uh, Margaret. Okay, I just wanted to say that in the, uh, the exchange, it, it's in the, uh, the bar, isn't it, that uh, that that Mr. Jagger is, uh, introduces himself, and he's very very dramatic when Mr. Wopsle Wopsle is uh, reading the, the uh, newspaper account of the the murder trial, and he's so dramatic. It, it is like a play that he is enacting while he's reading it, and he's all carried away with that. And then uh, Mr. Jaggers comes in and challenges him very very dramatically. And uh, so I just wanted to bring, you know, that focus to that, that it, it, it's all a drama. And as we know, that, uh, that the courtroom is a great place for drama, too, also with dramatizations like 12 Angry Men in the United States and the Scopes trial, so that uh, we can't get enough of uh, trial dramas, including contemporary television. But uh, that that is one thing that I wanted to point out was the drama of uh, of Mr. Jagger's presentations and how he enjoys it and how he is so uh, compartmentalized himself, you know, also with the washing of the hands and everything, he's, he's very much a creature of habit and a very conscientious habit. And then when he gets into the, uh, the Gargery household, he has the confrontation with, uh, with Joe Gargery. And in this, I, I have to disagree with John Jordan in uh, in the the um, evaluation of of Joe's character, I think that especially in that confrontation with uh, Mr. Jaggers, he presents the basic humanity of the situation. You know what? I won't take money for this child that came to me, and uh, I embraced with all my heart. So uh, I think that that confrontation where Joe Gargery is so incoherent, and that he is so. Uh, he is in, incoherent, and that is he's he's uh, he bows to his uh, emotion, and but he gets across his message very well. Anyway, I'm I'm sorry to go on and on like that, but I I just wanted to to think about the drama of uh, of uh, of it all. <laughs> Thank you. Haggard's, Take care. Haggard's characteristic form of social intercourse is cross examination starting with the assumption that you're probably guilty. Blair? I'm struck um, by Jagger's emphasis on money and wonder if his moral anchor is money um, as opposed to uh, believing in the Ten Commandments or, uh, or some other uh, moral or ethical source or basis for uh, decision making. He makes the uh, point you know, on several occasions that he is only doing what he is doing because he is paid to do it. Um, and that that just strikes me. Uh, I don't know much uh, how much more to make of that. Anyone? Yo, know, Clark. I'm just struck by the exchange that Jag and Pip have. Uh, it's on my page 140, uh, where Pip has to play the guessing game. And what's the correct word to use in that exchange? And Jaggers has an answer, but he makes Pip guess it. And it's he, Jagger is a lawyer, he has a different language, he has a different sensibility, uh, and it, just a painful passage uh, when at at loose ends. He, where to go with the the coded language that Jaggers uses. Jaggers is not taking responsibility. 
getting towards the end of the second hour, what have we not touched on that somebody really wants to look at? Wayne. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't want to leave Jaggers without commenting on that scene when he is baiting Joe over the indentures and Joe gets up and is about to knock Jaggers out of his chair. And I <laughs> yes. think that's interesting. It would be great to see that. It's, it's funny, but uh, Pitt calls it a foul, pugilistic purpose. <laughs> so there again, you have the the working class able to assert itself against, <laughs> yeah, against the, the upper, the better people, supposedly. <laughs> you wanted to look at chapter 19. And if, if you want to say- You look at it, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some beautiful <laughs> writing in it. With That's the chapter where Pip is leaving with very conflicted emotions going away and feeling he didn't do it very well and maybe he should get down and go back. Shana has her hand up. Yeah, Shana. You're muted. We haven't talked about Stella at all. Hardly. We, we, we haven't talked about his love that he's somehow doing this all for because he loves this woman who he, you know, is devastated when you know, what happens, you know, when she goes off with somebody else. But I think that uh, there's a point where, you know, that was his that was his whole purpose was to elevate himself so that he could be with her that she would since she had gotten so educated if he became a gentleman then maybe yeah. as a gentleman they would be able to get together he would be up more in her class you might say i don't think it's accidental that she is off stage for most of what we've read oh okay pip starts with what's almost a crush and their relationship is quite static. And then Estella is sent away. Right. That's what I'm saying. Uh, she gets sent away. And we don't, haven't talked much that she got sent away, but he still has feelings for her. Yes, but they're uh, not reinforced or oh, okay. corrected by actual exposure to her. Okay. Uh, He's not realistic, and then okay. except that he does know she's disdainful of him. Right. Okay. Dickens is keeping her off stage with a but, purpose. But, but isn't Jagger, maybe this is ahead of it, isn't Jagger setting up that whole thing with the other boy that he's, that other boy that's, uh, um, is going to school with him? But maybe not. Maybe that's ahead of myself there for yeah, the next time. I'm ahead, okay. You're getting ahead of us. us. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> Irene? Um, I just wanted to raise the point, something I didn't notice on a previous reading, uh, of the anonymity of both Miss Havisham's husband, uh, or to be a fiancé, and the half-brother. Uh, and I, you know, sort of, I'm left with this question, you know, I'm, because I can't remember what happened later as to how whether these two gentlemen are going to pay a, play a part later in the novel. And is this deliberate leaving them anonymous when Herbert talks that tells the story? Very much, I think. <laughs>